What is up, theology nerds? This is Trip, and you're listening to the Homebrewed Christianity Podcast, where we bring you some zesty, ideological ingredients for you to brew your own faith. And today on the podcast is a legend, a real deal legend, Sally McFay. That's right. Uh Uh-huh. A feminist process theologian extraordinaire, pioneer of uh, all sorts of theological uh, images, conclusions, ideas that uh, people today are like, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Well, where did it come from? Uh, Sally McFay. And here she is in in her 80s, and her brain is a hopping and a popping and a bopping and is about to pack your brain pipe full of ingredients. You know what I mean? Mm Mm-hmm. So here's the thing. Uh, I'm going to be with her in Vancouver, Canada, uh, for this conference called Reimagining God in the World. And it includes Jay McDaniel. Uh Uh-huh. He he runs uh, JesusJazzBuddhism.org, a really sweet process website. John Cobb is going to be there. Sally McFay and myself, July 10th through 11th of the year 2016, Vancouver. Uh, The 11th through the 15th. There's going to be a class, ecology, no, eco-theology in the spirit, with uh, with Jay having a guest like Sally and John around. Um, on Wednesday night, the 13th, um, there's going to be an open lecture uh, on eco-theology at Canadian Memorial United Church. On the 14th, Thursday, there's going to be a, uh, a process theology and Jesus understanding of God lecture at St. Andrew's Wesley United Church. By John Cobb. John Cobb on the 14th. Then on the 15th, that's Friday night at Canadian Memorial United Church, you're going to have a live podcast with me. And um, you're going to be hearing the wisdom of the elders. John Cobb and Sally McFay are going to be in the his house. And Trevor, Trevor, if you remember from the um, when, I, when I did the five hours of back-to-back interviews about my book, Trevor is helping put this together. They're launching a new process theology like center, a group. Uh, a collective in Vancouver. So if you're a theology nerd and you want to hang out with people that are like into like God and justice and caring for the planet and the poor and meet really cool people, have delicious local craft beer, then Friday night, July 15th, you, you got to be a Canadian Memorial United Church. That's Saturday the 16th, 9 to 4. It's an all-day theology nerd boot camp. And John Cobb and Jay McDaniel are going to join me. So you'll get to see me with John and Sally and Jay in Vancouver uh, the 10th through the 17th. There are all the dates that stuff's happening. I'll be doing junk on the 15th and 16th. So uh, head to the website. There's linky links. So you can um, you can find out more about this. So before we jump in the podcast, I just want to say uh, I'm excited about being there. Uh, it, it's a real treat. And, and when you get done listening to this interview with Sally McFay, you're going to go... Uh, trip, you finally interviewed Sally McFay. I've been waiting for you to do this forever. Or, how how have I existed as a theology nerd without knowing who Sally McFay is? Like, that's what's going to happen. And then you're going to go to homebrewedchristianity.com, and you're going to, you're going to like, go get at least one of our books. They're going to blow your mind. It's it's so good. And, and, and then you're going to tell your friends. You're going to tweet about it. Share it on Facebook. You know what I'm saying? Say, look, look, listen to this. This is Sally McFay. Sally McFay. If you don't know who this is, now, then, 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 then put on your, like, uh, theology nerd boots and, and start listening. All right. So before, before, before I jump in, I need to tell you something. This is the thing. I found out uh, when I was talking to Sally before the interview started that she had read my book, A Homebrewed Christianity Guide to Jesus, and said nice stuff about it. And she had heard about it from Catherine Keller, who had said she liked it and is assigning it in the fall for her intro to systematic theology at Drew uh, Divinity School, a uh, regular partner and sponsor of the podcast. So if, if you haven't read my book or even thought about reading it, then I want to send you the first chapter. You can check it out and, 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 and decide what you think. If you text freaking awesome, no space, freaking awesome to 44222 in the United States, that is freaking awesome to 44222. You'll get sent the uh, first chapter. You can check it out. And here's why. 
the past two weeks, I've been like number one to number three um, on Amazon for Jesus books because Fortress, the publisher, is doing an ebook sale, so you can get the book for three ninety nine on the Kindle and just like ten something in, in physically. That's like cheaper than I could buy my own book. So I might even just have to go buy myself some more copies of my book because it's because it's that cheap right now. And this is like the greatest summer reading ever. Okay, I mean, I know I wrote it and I'm completely biased, but my mom might even agree. My mom liked the book. So me and my mom uh, and Cora, my two-year-old daughter, because she doesn't, like, she likes pictures. And my book for Theology Book has more pictures in it than normal. Anyway, text freaking awesome to 44222 in the U.S. Or go to homebrewedchristianity.com. If you're if you're overseas and there's a little little box on the right side that says read the first chapter, boom, and you do that and you get a sent for free, and, and then what happens? What happens? You taste it and then you're like for four dollars, three ninety nine on Kindle, I should clearly get this and give it as a gift to hundred friends, or not? I mean, you don't have to. I'm just saying. All right, um, this is Sally McFay, legendary theologian, going to be in uh, Vancouver. In July, hope to see you there. Maybe at the Wild Goose before that. If you haven't got your tickets, Goosecast 2016, get uh, 25% off. I am uh, just, I'm really thrilled. Really thrilled to be doing this. I'm really, really, really grateful for Sally to get on. And I can't wait to see her in person. I uh, don't know, I don't know how many nerd tears I'll cry when I get a selfie with, with, with John Cobb and Sally McFay at the same time. It's, it's on my agenda. I mean, I like I could like really just yeah, yeah, just tear up, and you'll understand right after this podcast. So thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing it. Thanks for listening so long that I keep getting to interview people I've read their books, respect, and have inspired me. And Sally's one of them. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. Peace. Hello, Homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Trip, and today you're getting an audiological ingredient to brew your own faith that uh, has been, uh, it, it, this voice has been in my head for years. Um, when I was an undergrad, I read Models of God in a, uh, uh, my senior seminar, and have since then uh, just uh, always had Sally McFay as this figure in my head giving me advice. And 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 it's, it's like... Uh, it is a big a treat as a podcast can give someone to get to talk to like a theological nerd hero uh, who's inspired you and provoked your, your, your faith and your thinking. And today you're going to get to hear me just be excited while I talk to the one and the only Sally McFay. How are you doing today? Well, I'm doing fairly well considering that uh, I'm trying to recover from your uh, introduction. Uh, if you were excited about this interview, I was terrified about it for the last week um, because uh, it isn't the u- the usual form that uh, I take. Although I'm delighted to be here and look forward to a good conversation. And so far, you're not too terrifying. Oh, that 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 is good to hear. Um, and and for those of you that don't know, um, you can head to the website attached to this episode and get links to all of her her, her books. We'll end up talking about uh, and, and more. Um, but for for most of her career, she was at Vanderbilt, um, teaching theology there. Was dean there, uh, and now is in Vancouver at the Vancouver School of Theology, where I'll be in July. So if you're a Canadian on the west coast of Canada and want to do some uh, process theology this summer. Jay McDaniel, John Cobb, Sally McFay and I are all going to be there for a week in July uh, having fun. And there'll be links to that on the website as well, so you can check that out. Now, not everyone who listens is a complete theology nerd who, when your name is mentioned, just has their, uh, uh, their, their internal bibliography start flashing with all the footnotes where you've, you've been present. Um, and when we, we get to have conversations on the podcast with theologians who've made such a big impact, I, I think it's important to begin with just hearing how it is that Sally uh, became a theologian. Um, and, and those are always unique and, and, and powerful stories for getting an insight into uh, wrestling with uh, the ideas and, and concepts you've brought up in your work. 
Okay. Um, well, I have given this some thought, and um, I will start with kindergarten. Uh, one of the reasons I'm a theologian is when I went to kindergarten and was five years old, I couldn't imagine ever not going to kindergarten. I had one day there, and I knew that this was what I wanted to do the rest of my life. Um, that is, I wanted to go to school. And um, when I was seven years old, um, I had another uh, interesting experience. I was walking home from school one day, and all of a sudden, I realized that I wouldn't be here someday. I didn't think that I was going to die. It was simply that Christmas would come and I wouldn't be here. And then I couldn't imagine it, but my birthday, May the 25th, would come and I would not be here. How could that be? And I couldn't let go of that idea. And of course, this was the first awareness that comes to everybody uh, eventually that they are contingent, that they do not have to exist, and someday they won't exist. Uh, so I assume those two things, that is wanting to be in a classroom and thinking about uh, such matters as life, death, and God, uh, turned me in the direction of being a theologian. I think another major influence, certainly in the ecological direction, is that uh, we had, uh, my little family had a one-room cottage in Cape Cod uh, when I was a child, and we went there every summer. And you could take off most of your clothing and just run. And that was a wonderful experience for me. And then, finally, another influence was um, being a literature major in college. And I realized that um, So my ancillary field um, as a theologian has not been philosophy, as it is for many theologians, but literature. And this is one of the reasons why I have spent most of my life uh, on religious language and why that is uh, an important area, certainly not the only important area, but it is an important area. So uh, that's, there's not um, probably asking a person why they became something. Uh, is uh, This is simply the, the things that come to my mind. That, uh, cool. I, I so when you mention that kind of early uh, kind of uh, passion and love for for learning and for literature, um, how did that uh, that passion get connected with kind of critical attempts at faithful reflection around God? Mm. Well, um, I, I I don't know. I mean, I I went to uh, university education. My college education was good. And uh, I think, I mean, because my field was literature and a minor uh, in religion, uh, those were the fields that I was studying. And I was at a place where they demand good critical thinking. Mm -hmm. so no matter what subject you were uh, speaking about, there had to be a certain level. And uh, so I'm, I, I think that was the reason. So early, early in your career, you in, in, in speaking on parables, um, you you make this connection between um, uh, theology and attentiveness to language and, and this type of thing to the fore. But for a long time in the history of Christian thought, um, the question of theological language or of God talk wasn't always on uh, Front Street, or it wasn't always uh, a theological methodology wasn't always something the theologian had to attend to. Um, and, and, and I'm interested in how you understand the role or necessity uh, of dealing with these methodological and, and, and the question of the turn to language uh, in, in Christian theology. Uh, right. Well, I do feel that... Um the language that we use to talk about God and ourselves is absolutely critical. Uh, I am amused at times when we're in a conversation and people will say, uh, for instance, about some ecological matter, well, let's stop talking about it and do something. But for human beings, talking about something is doing it because a lot of our action is linked 
to our language. And um, while there's not a tight connection between belief and lifestyle, I mean, between language and lifestyle, um, there is certainly a connection. And if people are not given the option of being able to uh, see alternatives to the language that they are using, then uh, what, other, what other language do, do they have? And uh, this comes becomes very clear in the book that I wrote that is probably the most influential still is the Models of God book. And uh, in there, um, I deal with metaphor and the difference between metaphor and symbol and description. And um, a lot of people think that talk about God is descriptive of God, but um, none of our conversation, none of our talk about really important matters can be descriptive, whether it's love or belief or death. These all have to go sideways into trying to get at what, what we mean. For instance, if you call war a chess game, uh, this is a metaphor that's going to block out some things and make other things very clear. That is, it's going to concentrate on strategy, but it won't give you any blood. And um, for, again, when the, the question, uh, when I was working on models of God, of the fatherhood of God, was very, very uh, powerful in the early days of feminism. And um, people had quite a shock when they thought, well, if, if um, when I suggested that uh, God's name is not father, but it might also be mother, that is, it, we're not naming God. We're trying to use the images and experiences of our own life that make the deepest impact on us in order to talk about those things that are most precious to us and are most difficult to talk about. And those are things like love. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so forth. So getting that, I remember my mother uh, who read Models of God, and she said, you, you mean I don't have to talk about God as Father? Uh, I said, no. Uh, and this is for a lot of people just freeing. I mean, it doesn't mean that you can talk about, use any kind of language, but it opens up the possibility of a far more, a far richer vocabulary. I know that there's a certain fear in different uh, parts of the church once you open up uh, yeah. the way in which we engage scripture and tradition, uh, mm -hmm. the way in which it appears you could be relativizing for yeah. some theologians, like special revelation of God, when mm -hmm. God tells us who God is as Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or something. Mm -hmm. um, but in in uh, models of God, in exploring the relationship of metaphors and models and concepts and the relationship between the sources and resources of theology, I, I, I think in that uh, section of the book, you, you give us a, a framework for critically and faithfully engaging the tradition where fidelity to it uh, doesn't mean uh, regurgitation and just pure repetition of mm -hmm. the metaphors of the past yeah yeah you're you've said that very clearly and well uh, but it isn't easy i mean it is easier to simply use the language that one has inherited from the tradition because once you get into the level of metaphor and symbol uh, you're talking about um It is no longer descriptive. That is, one has to have a different set of criteria. What are some of these criteria? Well, uh, for me, one of the ways that I limit my conversation about God, certain models of God, is uh, whether they uh, connect with my own experience, whether they connect with the experience of other people in the church, and finally, whether they are good for the planet and for other life forms. I mean, it, there's a variety of, you can't say because it isn't a description. So one has to have a variety of uh, reasons why one accepts it. And uh, that engages you then in the uh, battle of interpretation. And I, I don't think there's any way to escape it. I mean, why should we think that talking about God would be easier than talking about 
anything that happens in our lives. I mean, it's the most difficult language of all. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the theologians who have ever uh, been significant have always said, uh, as Aquinas said, he said, everything I have written is like straw. And Augustine said, we babble like babies trying to find some language to talk about. Well, I think there's a sense where uh, uh, it, it takes some time in endeavoring for Christians to realize the necessary humility when talking about God. But that, like, as you mentioned, isn't unlike the humility we need when talking about anyone else. It's like uh, our partners who we're, we're committed to and love remain our partners when they remain subjects and are mm-hmm. mysteries and not objects that we kind of own and possess externally. Mm-hmm. So why a tradition where images like father and mother and lover and friend and all these type of things function to connect us to this, is God that's engaged and invested in the world, would we, would we ever want closure and finality? Um, we don't want that for anyone relating to us, or we don't want it to someone we're relating to, or that's the end of the relationship. Mm-hmm. Oh, beautifully put. I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, it's interesting because the people that we're closest to, that is our lovers and our children and our mothers and fathers, are the ones that we probably know the least in the sense that you are talking about. That is what really in, turns them on, what is their internal story. And trying to get at the story of another person is it a huge assignment. So. Talking about God, absolutely. Uh, we should creep around on our knees. And um, all great uh, poetry and religious traditions use um, uh, a few metaphors. I mean, things like food, sex, breath, fire, and water. These are the basic experiences of life, its beginning and its continuation. And those become the metaphors that we work with. Uh, most closely because they have to do with such important uh, matters of our existence. And so uh, this is why talking about God, about religious language is so complicated and why we need to pay a lot of attention to it. So, uh, yes, well, you've, you've uh, hit on some very important and some very important issues. When Models of God came out, um, you, you talk about it as a theology for an ecological and nuclear age. And uh, I'm interested in how you would describe our age today. Would you, would you highlight the same things? Would you add something or change it? What, how do you understand where we are and what time it is as a, as a human species? Yeah. Well, like many others, uh, while I don't wish or intend to be apocalyptic, I think we are in the end game and need to really take seriously this one issue, uh, the climate change, which includes so many other issues. And um, uh, we had, if we had paid attention 20 or 30 years ago when people first began to realize that we were going to be in difficulty, that would have been one thing, but we didn't. And so now we are at the end stage and people are beginning to wake up. There are fewer uh, climate deniers than they were before. And uh, most governments are beginning to, uh, but whether we're going to have time to make the kinds of in-depth changes that are necessary is a a big issue. And um, I'm, I'm not apocalyptic about it because I think that, uh, human beings can do amazing things, as they showed, for instance, during the Second World War. The world became mobilized, and here we're facing something even more serious. So where there's a will, there's a way. But the question is, is there a will? Mm-hmm. This is what, why I think the uh, religious communities are particularly uh, should be concerned with the, the language that we use. For instance, uh, in Genesis, where uh, God says, presumably, um, dominate the world and subdue it. Well, that's what people seem to remember. And yet seven times in that uh, same passage, God 
whenever God creates something, God stands back, as it were, and says, it is good. It is good. Now, that's an aesthetic judgment, which is not, it's good for me, or it's good for you, or it's good for certain people, et cetera. No, it's just plain good. So everything is just plain good. That's the bottom line. And uh, this is why it, it then becomes very complicated, because if only certain people, or, uh, and certainly it's hard to conclude all the animals, if they're going to be have to be flourishing as well, uh, where do you stop? Uh, can, where do we build the wall? I don't think there's any way to build a wall. You can't build it. There's no way to... Uh, put a fortress up around ourselves. So we are in a very, very critical time. And the kind of decisions that we make now are going to be, uh, going to say a lot about what the next 10, 20, 30 years is going to be like. Mm -hmm. I think that desire to build and put up a wall, like metaphorically points to a, a significant fallacy of misplaced concreteness that somehow putting a barrier between people eliminates our connections and our responsibility to each other. And if, if when we as human species decide to put uh, all sorts of walls between uh, people and other each other, when that happens, we also tend to uh, point that the problem of the system and the situation is external to us as if the problem was some substance that's sitting over there rather than these to toxic pathological patterns of relations that exist across uh, us as, as a human species. And that dynamic um, that you point out um, in, in the book is also something that about uh, we put walls between God and the world and that leads to theologies uh, that when when practiced and believed and faithful to, uh, miss the dynamic interaction um, th that's constitutive of the Jewish and Christian tradition about the God-world relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet so many people would hear, uh, when you kind of develop the world as God's body, or, or when people hear types of pan-Indiaism described, as if this is something extremely foreign and different um, uh, from the tradition, as opposed to kind of, a return to a vision of the living and life-giving God that uh, the Enlightenment didn't manage to uh, sterilize. Yeah, well, that's a number of very good points there. And just to pick out one of them, the body metaphor, which um, uh, I think uh, when you mentioned that it, to some people, sounds, uh, I remember uh, talking about the body metaphor, the world is God's body, to some uptight Presbyterians, granted it was several decades ago, and they kept their eyes down because it was just so embarrassing to think of God as having a body. But, you know, we Christianity is an incarnational religion. Well, what do we mean by that? It, does it mean only that Jesus of Nazareth was fully God and fully human, as uh, the the tradition says, or is uh, the world is God's body a way of expressing the broadness of God's incarnation? God is always the one who is with us. So that uh, religion, being a Christian, doesn't have to do just with the spirit. It has to do with the earth, with the body. It has to do with where we are now. Uh, God is not off there, up there, out there. God is right here in the garden, in our world. And the longer that I have lived with the body metaphor, uh, the richer it seems to me uh, that it, um, it allows us to be religious in the deepest sense of the word while we are also in love with the world. Um, just a little side story here. Again, when I was seven years old, uh, but no, wait a minute, this isn't true. When Pierre, when Pierre Teilhard de Chardin was seven years old, he had two thoughts, and that is he loved the world and he loved God, and he couldn't imagine giving up an evil mood. And uh, I didn't come to that conclusion when I was seven, but eventually I have over my life. And uh, to or, in order to, to, it's wonderful to be able to be um, fully in love with the world and fully in love with God, and not to find these opposite. In fact, they are connected. You can't be, I don't think, love the world 
Uh, and, I mean, you can't love God unless you love the world. So uh, the body metaphor is, uh, again, I'm saying it's one of those basic things like food, sex, breath, fire, and water that is so close to us, so intimate, that uh, it serves as a powerful metaphor for emphasizing. Uh, it also provides uh, a lot of, uh, Another understanding of the Eucharist, that is, it focuses the Eucharist on sharing food rather than on substitutionary atonement. So um, I, I, again, metaphors, there is no one metaphor that we can hold with. The minute we think of any metaphor uh, as a description, then we've ruined it. So the world is God's body is not meant as a description. We don't have any descriptions of God, but it's one of those ones that I think is powerful and is very close to the Christian tradition because of its claim to incarnationalism. Mm -hmm. So when you look back at this point and have thought through the responses uh, to the book and why it's remained uh, so influential, uh, what kind of what kind of thoughts come to your mind? Well, we all go through this kind of initiation or baptism by fire when we I mean, that is how all Christians do, I think, in one form or another at some stage in their life in which they have to move from uh, whatever faith they have received uh, and make it their own. And when that happens, then you, one, uh, uh, for instance, it came to me when I, I was, I remember being in, uh, in college in a seminar on Jesus and um, on the historical Jesus. And we were reading about how a good deal of what is said about Jesus is not quote unquote true. Well, I had a terrible time with that. I just couldn't manage it with that. And uh, again, this is how, why people have trouble with new models of God when you're talking about uh, different language. So it's, and in, in one sense, people would ra ra almost rather hold on to a bad language than not to have any. So you can't just say, uh, don't talk about God as Father. You have to give people an alternative. And uh, I embrace God as Father because I think it's a very powerful metaphor. But I would introduce also the body metaphor as uh, in line with Christian thinking, although it is a new concept. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so much the better because I think uh, all theology has to uh, make sense of the tradition in terms of the present time. And uh, I can't imagine us uh, talking about Christian responsibility to the world these days without talking about climate change. And that talks about bodies. Yeah. And one of the things I think that's uh, helpful that you, that you develop in, in your work is that the, the, like the image of the world as the body of God doesn't just have implications for the God world relationship. It also has important ones uh, for us and understanding our own bodies and embodiment and the diversity and multiplicities of embodied life uh, in the cosmos. So can, can you say, uh, say a bit about uh, how this image of the God world relationship and affirmation of embodiment changes uh, other assumptions that are kind of held in a logjam theologically uh, with a number of this kind of meta, uh, like the monarchial model leaves it locked in. Yeah, yeah. well, that's a huge issue, very, very broad and deep question. And uh, I think it, uh, the body metaphor, uh, as you say, is so important to us in so many different ways. And in our culture, everything from anorexia to... Um, uh, people, com girls committing suicide because of their body image. I mean, uh, it's, it is so powerful. And um, one of the things that I like most about it is that it helps us to move, our, as I said before, but say it a little differently, our attention to, I mean, when you think of God, you don't 
put your head up and look up at the sky. Uh, many, I mean, that's what a lot of people do. You look, can you look out at the earth? Just look out, open your eyes up, pay attention to the world. And it gives us not only permission to love the world and to pay attention to it, but the demand that we do so. So um, really listening, really paying attention is a very rare thing. Most of us don't do it. We wait for somebody to finish what they're saying or butt in before they finish so that we can say something that we want. But we don't really pay attention to the other, whether it's another human being, uh, a little flower by the side of the road, uh, somebody in a child in pain, uh, pay attention to the world. And almost uh, one of the saints um, Teresa of Avila, I believe, said, if you're worried about your relationship with God, don't think about that. Think about the neighbor. Forget God and pay attention to loving the neighbor and you'll be okay. And uh, loving the neighbor is becomes, uh, when one realizes that it includes slugs and um, sloths and whales and trees and Every human being in the world, it includes everything. That is, the, um, uh, it, it is a, a pain, a loving the neighbor. The neighbor line has moved from next door to people like myself to including every life form on the planet. Well, that becomes an almost impossible assignment, and we despair at doing anything about this. Uh, the Dalai Lama says very much the same thing in his notion of great compassion. In fact, I think the, uh, the, the religions come together, not in terms of what they believe, but their practice of this simple thing, love the neighbor. But taken to its ultimate degree, it's the most difficult thing we could ever do. In fact, we'd almost love... I mean, we'd like to love anybody except the neighbor uh, because that's where the rubber hits the road. And uh, so, uh, absolutely. I mean, I guess the thing, one of the things that I have loved about being a Christian and finding out how radically incarnational Christianity is, is that that early desire and love for the world that I had running around in Cape Cod and bare feet and uh, building uh, tree houses and so forth. I didn't have to give it, that up. In fact, it can be intensified. Uh, and that's a, an enormous relief, I think. So, mm-hmm. yeah. and, and I don't, I think there are too many Christians who feel like that is definitely an either or choice they have to make. Um, and, and that part of the the job of, uh, of leaders and communicators within the churches uh, is to do a better job at telling <laughs> telling the good news is is one where um, uh, that affirmation of the goodness of our existence and and, and life and creation is it, it, it wasn't something that only exists in Genesis. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's. Uh... It should be uh, one of the things about, about the Christian tradition. I think it has uh, it's easy to make du- dualisms, and I don't want to overstress this, but I do think that the there is both the prophetic and the sacramental strain in Christianity, and um, you see the, the prophetic strain, particularly in Protestantism, and the sacramental strain particularly in Catholicism and Anglicanism and so forth. Both of these are necessary. Karl Barth had to say uh, to Hitler and the Nazis, nine, absolutely no, no. Uh, An absolute no is what the prophetic voice sometimes has to say, loud and clear. But it also has to say just as loudly and just as clearly, yes, in fact, uh, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. J.M. Uh, Hopkins is my favorite poet. And, um, uh, and Annie Dillard with her wonderful uh, love for the world. Uh, she says, and I think it's so uh, moving, she says, when we reach our death and finally have to depart, the thing that we should do is not say to our host uh, more and more and more, but thank you very much. It's been a wonderful time. 
And uh, to be able to say that about one's, about life is, I think, a Christian demand, every bit as much as it is a demand to say no when certain things need to have a strong no said to them. Mm-hmm. So that combination of, I think, suffering, being able to deal with suffering and the negative and the evil, uh, along with the most positive, glorious joy, uh, which uh, means we don't have to hold anything in. You can weep and wail and carry on because things are terrible. I mean, when a child dies, for instance, nothing could be worse, and you should weep and wail. And when you are holding a baby in your arms, uh, what can you do but rejoice? So um, I want to say a word um, about kenosis, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. With, with you. Um, the reason this is so important is the uh, substance of my last book. And the last book is sort of a summary of my whole career. Uh, the book is called uh, Blessed Are the Consumers, uh, Climate Change and the Necessity for, uh, re- for the Restraint of uh, uh, for the practice of restraint. And um, kenosis is often, it means, uh, it's a Greek word, it means self-emptying. And when people hear it for the first time, they think it's negative. It seems ascetic. It seems as though you're going to be flagellating and uh, being very, very negative. Some little uh, monk out in the desert who doesn't have enough food and who, uh, you know, tries to empty himself to allow God in. Well, that... It, I think we're, we've missed the whole point of what this is about. Uh, as I understand a canonic view, it is really a description um, of love. Uh, that is, love is an activity. It's not something that we can point to. It isn't something that has substance and sets of being. It's a, an activity. And interestingly enough, here with kenosis, a, an odd sounding word, uh, I think the best, best example of it is the Trinity, which is another conundrum. I mean, how many people want to talk about the Trinity uh, and understand it? And when I had, when I was introduced to a canonic view of the Trinity, which means simply that the persons as the parts, as it were, of the Trinity are in a reciprocal, mutually reciprocal give and take, sharing, stepping back, stepping forward, life and death kind of relationship. This is what God is. God is not a being. God is closer to an activity, and that activity is love, and love is always involves sacrifice. It means giving others some space. And you can see kenosis in creation, where God, as it were, steps back and allows other things to exist. So that God says, after creating everything, it's good. It isn't connected. It isn't good for me. It's good. And allowing uh, love always involves stepping back and allowing others to live, to have room and to have space. And um, uh, an under- a canonic understanding then of the uh, of salvation is not primarily, I don't think, the substitutionary atonement, where Jesus does it all and takes all our sins upon Himself and so forth. But it is the Eastern Christian view of deification. That is, we human beings are made in the image of God, Imago Dei. This is a classic understanding of who we are. And what does it mean to be made in the image of God? Well, again, we are referred to, first of all, Jesus' life, which uh, Jesus is, for Christians, the face of God. And Jesus is also the image uh, of human life for human beings. So Jesus is a a key pin uh, right in the middle there for knowing about God and knowing about ourselves. And uh, so that... um, the, again, we come back to this absolutely central idea of radical love in which one pulls back and allows others to exist. And I think one of the ways to see this most clearly not, is in the Jesus story, 
Certainly, he lived his whole life this way. His parables are about this. But also in the, sta- in the lives of some saints. And I think of people like Dorothy Day and uh, Nelson Mandela and the Dalai Lama and uh, John Woolman. Uh, you can think, why are these people saints? I think it's because they try to practice this incredible opening up themselves and letting God live through them. So that... Paul, who says in Galatians 2, I don't live, but Jesus Christ lives in me, or I live in Christ. So it's a radical participation of all of everything that exists in God. Now, this is another form of panentheism, what it means. And it's, I I think, as I understand it now, this uh, understanding kenosis as central means understanding love as the central uh, certain kind of love, of self-emptying love in which you pull yourself out of the middle so that God has room, a channel to get at you. Uh, it isn't that we can do all these things. Dorothy Day said she couldn't possibly face another day of working in the ghettos in, uh, uh, in New York City if she didn't go to Mass early in the morning. That is, she needed to open herself, fill herself with God's love so that she could be a channel uh, during the day to uh, move God's love towards other people. Now, I'm sorry, I've gone on and on and on about that, but it is, I I think, a very important, uh, well, I think it's a a renewal of the Christian tradition. This goes way back to it isn't some new idea, fancy idea that we thought up with climate change or anything of the sort. It goes back to the earliest days of Christianity, and it's an alternative to the, um, I think, to another understanding of salvation, which is focused more on individuals and their sinful relationship, in which Jesus does it all in order to take everything himself. And do it for us. Whereas this demands a tremendous amount of, for uh, on us. But it says you are not doing this on your own. What you are doing is opening yourself so that God can work through you. In the in the book, you describe the the challenge of where our understanding of the neighbor includes you know, all living things, um, and uh, in in it that kind of radically inclusive image of love one of the the things you highlight is that we should focus on the visible neighbor uh, as opposed to the invisible god and something that popped in my head uh when you were then taking kenosis to the question of uh, of atonement and substitutionary atonement and such when you think of the image uh in uh in the new testament of jesus or the christ as the image of the invisible god um, in a sense, uh, what's being substituted on the cross is our image of God from this kind of uh, a transcendent, unmoved mover who's external and perfect by not being changing and engaged with an image of God who is the most othered one, the suffering one, and, uh, and, and throughout the whole ministry of Jesus. The, yeah. the, the places Jesus promises to be are like in relationships where you... Uh, 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 offer forgiveness and honesty uh, at a table with bread and wine and friends and the promise of hope and in the least of these. And yeah. that type of substitution on the cross is the opposite way a lot of us see it. Yeah. Oh, very well put. Uh, I, I, I think, again, some people think that substitutionary atonement, particularly the view from Anselm in the Middle Ages that God takes the punishment that we deserve on God's self and releases us from it and so forth, that this is a description of what happened on the cross. No, I mean, nobody knows. Uh, Jesus did, was crucified. We are pretty sure of that. That's one of the few historical certainties. But what it means is not written above Uh, saying this is substitutionary atonement. I think this understanding, uh, what you have just described, as Jesus, as the face of God, who tells Christians, informs Christians of who God is and who we are, is a wonderful 
uh, mirror for us. How do we know how to talk about God? We don't. And uh, it isn't the talk, that Jesus is the only way to God. No, but people who call themselves Christians say, yes. So his whole, as you pointed out, Jesus' whole life was lived. That is, it's understanding uh, the, uh, the kind of humiliation and openness and uh, graciousness and forgiveness that he gives all along to his, to others is then culminated in the cross. The cross is very important. I mean, it's the sort of quintessential thing about his life, but it isn't unconnected to everything else in his life. And it's saying uh, to us who are disciples, uh, it isn't sufficient, friends, to just say, Jesus saves me and I don't have to do anything. That's a Protestant temptation because Protestants don't want to uh, participate in their own salvation. Well, what this other view is saying is, folks, um, this is what it means to be uh, in the image of God, is to try and live the way God lived, both in Jesus and in the story of Jesus and in the story of the various saints that we have, and uh, in, as we understand it, uh, in God's God's self, that is to talk about the Trinity, is the same thing. So we don't have to have a whole different, um, I want a, a footnote here, uh, I want to add, not only is, um, does Kenosis talk about uh, total uh, compassionate, open, self-emptying love, but it is still, it is also, that is to say, it's a description of the highest of God, in God's self, but it's also uh, it's in continuity with evolution. And by that, I mean, uh, I'm not talking about any kind of design or, or uh, proof for the existence of God. I'm saying that the pattern in evolution, which is one of radical sharing and giving and taking, uh, giving life and death. I mean, whether you like it or not, evolution will... Uh, force you in these directions. And what Kenosis says is that human beings, as far as we know, are the only animals that can do this voluntarily. Mm-hmm. That is, everybody's going to give up their life. I mean, there's no doubt about that. But you can open up your uh, your abilities, your powers, your insights, your love to others. Uh, so that altruism and evolution, uh, they're not the same thing, but they're continuous and I find a very high value as a Christian as a religious person to be able to believe the same thing at all aspects of my life so that I go to church I don't have to hang my brain at the door and forget about evolution I can be the same person in church as on the street and uh, so I think life becomes very um, it, 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 continuous in a powerful sense, so that one does not have to be dualistic. Uh, religion isn't a creepy thing. In fact, it's a, it's, a, it's loving your neighbor, the most ordinary thing in the world. It also apparently happens to be the nature of reality, uh, that is, of evolution, uh, of how we got here. Uh, so, I guess my journey as uh, over these 83 years has <laughs> uh, been one of delight as I've gotten further and further into the, tradi- to the tradition. And rather than having it turn me off, as it does some people, it has, uh, it has opened up other possibilities that I never dreamed of. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is such a gift. Oh yeah. So I I had a uh, I had five questions people sent in, and uh, so these are um, you know listener submitted questions, uh, knowing they might get a chance to get an answer from you. Um, and so you know they move around a bit. But uh, the, the first one uh, is from Hannah Heinziker. She runs the uh, Feminite, which is the feminist Mennonite. Uh, blog does. Uh, she's a former Claremont student uh, and pretty awesome. Anyway, she's like, she said, I love McFay's concept of the wild space as a way to tap into empathy and understand overlapping forms of oppression. I've wondered sometimes, though, whether focusing in too much on the spaces where ourselves are oppressed can shield us from acknowledging our own privilege. 
creating a sort of victim complex. An example could be some white feminism at, at, at its worst. How has McVeigh thought about the ways the wild space might help address privilege? Or put another way, how do we avoid getting stuck in our wild spaces? Wonderful question. So glad wild space came up. I think it is one of the most freeing um, things on the one hand, and also one of the most the concepts we have to be most careful about. Let me explain. It is freeing in the sense that what wild space is, is one understands the world as a circle. And then one sees one's own world, as it were, as uh, coming mainly in that is superimposed upon the conventional world. But there's a part of it over on the side that sticks out that doesn't fit in the world. And this is your wild space. It might be because you are, uh, you're not the hegemonic human being. The hegemonic human being is white, male, Protestant, fit and trim, um, you know, all those other things that uh, fit into the classic uh, fashion magazine. So if you are marginalized in any way, if you're gay, if you are disabled, if you're old, if you're uh, not white, uh, there are all sorts of ways, even if you're fat, uh, whatever, um, gives you a place in the margin so that one can see differently. And uh, my son, bless him, who was one of these hegemonic human beings, I mean, really handsome fellow, uh, spent a year very close to uh, food stamps um, when he got out of college. He couldn't get a job. And for the first time in his life, he realized what it might be to be on the other side, to be marginalized. And that was an opening for him. Now, the problem is, and I think the one thing that, about this question that I like so much is the possibility of, femi- of victimization so that women, all women say, oh, well, we are victims. So that's my wild space because I'm a woman. So all women are uh, marginalized. This is not true. It is not true of me and uh, the kind of people that I write for, that is my audience, uh, anybody who's uh, above the poverty line or certainly in the lower middle class uh, is doesn't fit into that pattern. So you have to be very careful about wild space that you don't use it as an excuse to uh, say, me, 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 poor me. And there is a lot of this uh, narcissism in our culture. I think the whole, uh, I've done a lot of work on uh, autobiography. Uh, and uh, there are two types of autobiography. There's the Augustinian type, which is, confesses before God one's inadequacies and uh, asks God to guide one's life. And there's a, uh, another kind of uh, autobiography, which we see very much now on uh, Facebook and other social media, in which you talk about yourself endlessly. It's about what I had for breakfast, and why should anybody be interested in what you had for breakfast? But it's so narcissistic. Uh, so these are the problem with the wild space is it's a wonderful opening uh, to see, as my son did. It doesn't mean that he isn't a very uh, hegemonic person. No, but he says just because he went on food stamps and falls a little marginal, hey, he knew he could call me, which he did. And of course, I sent him a check. Uh, So, you know, that shows that we're not in that category at all. Uh, But the concept is think outside the box. Don't be afraid to do that. But realize when you are a member of the uh, privileged. Yeah, Yeah. that's great. Uh, The second question uh, said uh, time uh, recently acknowledged the the old God is dead uh, issue um, uh, from back in the day. And in, in the last 10 years or so, there's been a revival of, of radical theology, Christian atheism. Um, the Jesus Seminar is now doing a God Seminar um, where uh, uh, they're discussing the kingdom of God without God and, and things like that. Uh, and, and I know like the, the situation around Greta up in, in Canada, which people may not know, but there is, there's this whole new conversation on the reality of God and its relationship to theology and the church. Um, and 
and it's being played out in different ways. So the, the question lists off uh, a bunch of topics connected to it and then asks, um, uh, how does Sally see the reality of God for the theologian, uh, for the practitioner, and I assume this is practitioner in the congregation, and for uh, the, the lay person? Mm. Well, another very you have very good uh, people who listen to your uh, podcast, I can see, because they have good questions. Uh, yeah, that's a powerful one. And I think <clears throat> if any, excuse me, <clears throat> all the statistics show that for the most part, people are becoming more secularized. That is, they, fewer and fewer people believe in God. And what I think mainly they mean by this is the stereotypical God, the one that you look up to the sky, the supernatural, all-powerful, crypto-male, uh, everlasting uh, sort of understanding of God. And again, there's the problem here. People do not understand that all religious language is metaphorical. It says is, and it says is not. The is not is as important as the is. So you say, God is father, is, but is not. And uh, the reason for this is absolutely because our language is not descriptive. So what these people are saying is, I don't believe in the um, current popular caricature of God. But what they fail to uh, often do, and I I think this is very, very sad, uh, because they don't see the power of metaphor, uh, they think they can stop with the so-called stereotype of God as a, but it's, it's not a description. So there are alternatives and that's where we come in. And um, I think a lot of this discussion is people uh, hungry for some alternative language for talking about God. Uh, So you don't like the language that we have in, uh, in our society. Well, I don't either. Uh, So when we, begin to think differently, for instance, uh, well, what I have suggested in kenosis, where the understanding, just to take one issue, the understanding of power of the, of the, of the divine. Um, in the stereotypical view, God is all-powerful. God can do anything. This is why people say, why did God let little Susie die? Uh, why did God save me? from this plane accident and not my cousin and so forth, as if God was all controlling. Uh, Whereas a a kenosis understanding says that God is open. God is giving people a a chance to uh, make decisions themselves. Um, It's a, uh, God is understood, the God world relationship is understood more in terms of empowerment that is, God you know, allows for, encourage, persuades. Uh, and this is, again, why panentheism is one of the most interesting and attractive views these days. And among evangelicals, as well as other theologians, I think it is gaining uh, enormous uh, traction uh, because it allows one to say that God is, of, what is more powerful than empowerment? Think of the relation to your own children. What you want is not to beat them over the head and get them to do what you tell them. What you want to do is empower them so that they can make thoughtful, mindful decisions uh, on their own. And uh, so it it's um, moving the understanding that the problem of, <clears throat> I think, of a lot of atheism isn't so much that people don't believe in God. They don't understand they don't believe in the view that is current uh, just a little appendix here i have gone to many um, science and religion type meetings uh one of them with oh years ago and uh, uh these high level scientists and high level theologians and the interesting thing is the scientists expected us to be fairly literate about the latest findings in science but they have not read any theology beyond 
kindergarten. They didn't, they assumed for the most part that God, that the word God meant what our society means by it. So they were not up on panentheism or kenosis or process theology or liberation theology. They had read the best of our offerings, and that they expected us to be able to, uh, and I think they had a right to expect that, but I think we had the right to expect it also. So this is a very widespread phenomenon that people have got to realize it is not so much people don't believe in God, they don't believe in the only God that's being offered to them, and they are not being, and I think this is a huge task for the churches, they are not being given alternative language which they desperately need. Mm-hmm. So, so uh, that, that connects to the next question, and this is a, yeah. a new listener coming from a more con, uh, conservative, charismatic tradition. And, uh, and Manny asks, uh, I don't know if this is a good question, but it is, so I'll go ahead and, uh, or I wouldn't have read it. Um, where does one start when what comes to to grappling with feminist theology, it seems like a diverse topic that I need to address, but it feels overwhelming at first to discover you have so much to learn and don't know where to begin. Hmm. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I think in part, I see feminism as a new kind of consciousness. It isn't, so much that one has to get uh, up on all the different um, kinds and uh, movements and historical moments and so forth. I think what uh, most feminists say is that the, I think the feminist consciousness is very close to the ecological consciousness. That is, that it is saying that we are radically interdependent and interrelated with all other forms of life. And um, it usually is understood, this kind of consciousness, against what they call a patriarchal consciousness or a dualistic hierarchical consciousness in which certain human beings, certain life forms are in privileged positions and control others. So I go back to the canonic evolutionary pattern, which couldn't be, uh, I I do a little work on quantum physics, not very much because I don't understand it, but it sure is about, uh, down to the nano level, it's about uh, interrelationship, interdependence, and agential, the agency of all things. We are not the only agents. That is, we are not the only subjects that make decisions that change things. In fact, things are happening all the time by other agents. I mean, do you think climate change is not an agent? Yes, it has agency because it makes a difference in the nature of the world and what happens. So we have to realize that, um, to me, feminism and ecological thinking, uh, as I say, very close, I'm not certainly putting, a lot of men can be, uh, I would prefer to use the phrase ecological thinking rather than feminist because a lot of them are put off by that. Men don't want to think that, I mean, don't want to be feminists. They think they have to be women uh, to do that. I, I don't think it's true. I think it's an appreciation of a radically egalitarian, interdependent kind of way of being in the world. Mm-hmm. And the different types of theologies that develop out of this eco-feminist consciousness are, are plural, but the place to begin is learning to cultivate that type of consciousness as a part of your spiritual practice and such. Yeah, I would make an amendment, though, to that, too, and that is <clears throat> the uh, white feminists were the first to come along, I think, and in North America. And um, they complained, uh, that is, um, other people complained, uh, people of color, people who were poor, women who were poor, that white feminism did not include them. And uh, they were absolutely right in many respects. So I'm not saying that you only need to know this big picture of a change of consciousness. No, one needs to get very radically particular 
and understand that the situation of a uh, a mother with four kids in Guatemala uh, is very different than um, a middle class mother in uh, Vancouver, or most of them. At any rate, so it, the, both the general and the particular are both very important. So mm -hmm. one or the other. All right, one more question. This is from Austin Roberts. Uh, he said, I'd like to know uh, what she thinks about the increasingly popular and controversial language of the Anthropocene. What are its theological implications? Is it helpful to focus generally on the human as a driving geological force on the planet today, or is it potentially a problem? Um, uh, does she prefer other alternatives like capital scene, as Donna Haraway and others argue? Mm. Oh, that's a very pro that's a profound question, and <clears throat> I frankly don't feel up to answering it. I do think that the negative part of it, that is to say critically, that we are in the uh, era of the Anthropocene, that is to say, where human power has uh, reached such a limit that uh, one can say that the future of the unit of the planet. Uh, at least in terms of some species, not everything. I think the cockroaches will probably do fine, uh, but certainly the human population and some of the others is uh, at stake. And not only that, but the quality of our life is. I mean, we are going to go through a radical change in climate, which is going to mean these horrible weather things with droughts and floods and so forth. And we have got to meet them one way or another. We can meet them by trying to fortress ourselves, the few of us who have some means uh, apart and ride it out, or we can begin to act differently at the, at the get-go and try and get us through this with as least pain as possible and make sure that the pain is shared. So um, I, 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 it's only been in the last 100 years or less that we've had to wake up to the fact of how powerful we are. And uh, it, uh, it's now overwhelming. I mean, uh, uh, it's so late in the game and things are happening so quickly. Uh, I mean, we thought we'd have more time. We do not have very much time. And uh, so that's why I think the theologies are important. Religions are important because they help to form people's most basic feelings and pictures of themselves and what we as human beings should be doing in the world uh, couldn't be more important. And right now at this stage, I think a something like a canonic view in which we understand radical compassion and openness uh, to the other is uh, uh, very, very helpful interpretation, both of, reality and of Christian faith. And uh, we theologians cannot do much of anything. I mean, let's face it, uh, who pays attention to theologians any uh, time recently? But we have to get up in the morning and look in the mirror and look, uh, think about what we're doing. And uh, at the very least, I think we need to be trying to be as powerful and responsible as we can about the language that we use about God in ourselves. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so, 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 so much for uh, taking the time, uh, talking, answering uh, my questions and some of the listener questions. I am uh, super thrilled that I will get to see you again in person in, uh, in a month. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you in person as well in a month. And uh, thank you for this experience. It wasn't as grim as I had feared. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm very very glad. <laughs> yeah, no, you can be flattered because uh, it's true. I don't like interviews, and I don't do very many of them. I do think it's a powerful form, and I think the kinds of questions that you have asked and that your listeners have asked are very good ones. And so I say, continue on with the good work. All right, thank you very much. 
This podcast is sponsored by Phillips Seminary in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a theological school that offers Christian education in service of intelligent, just, and compassionate religious and civic communities. They welcome students to a safe space for truth-seeking conversation about the Bible, Jesus, and faithful living. They have on-campus and distance learning options. Go check them out at www.wherefaithleads.com.